Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. Welcome to tonight's installment of Screen Times, which hosts exclusive screenings of the most eagerly anticipated new movies, followed by conversations with top film talent. I want to give special thanks to the presenting sponsor of Screen Times, HBO, and share the following brief video message. We're going to be the number one media conglomerate in the world. Let's act like a happy family. Nobody has any glaring substance abuse issues that almost brought down the company, right? I always wanted one of you kids to take over. People would do well to remember there's going to be a new sheriff in town. Security! Back off! This is executive level business! We're coming up to the finishing line. Know your role. And remember, money wins. And now, please join me in welcoming New York Times culture reporter, Milena Rizek, and our special guest, the co-writer director of Where to Go Bernadette, Richard Linkletter. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Watch the movie, yeah. They just watched the movie. I know, it just ended. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for coming. I'm so excited to be here with, with Rick to talk about the film. We're going to have a pretty loose conversation. Always. Yeah. Nothing, nothing but. Talk about the film and the filmmaking process and his views on uh, how you put a career together. Um, I, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I want to start by asking, you said that you wanted to do this movie because the character of Bernadette reminded you of your mother. Mm. Is that a compliment? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it was just one of many, many things. In the, she was kind of an archetype in my mind. But it w no, it's more than that. I mean, it's obviously Bernadette's character, the complexity of her, I think the humor of the book. Uh, Maria's book is just kind of an exhilarating read. It's so funny and, and deep. You know, there's just a lot, so much going on in it. Huge challenge, you know. It a, it, what, what it was about was a lot of things, you know, portrait of a relation, you know, long-term relationship, mother-daughter. So it was, it was all those things, but I think probably mother-daughter was probably the biggest thing on my mind, heading in, and an artist who's not doing their art, how toxic that can be. So I, I related to all of it. Ultimately, you know, it's kind of a, you know, believe it or not, you know, there's a certain element. I think anything you do is so personal, so it's kind of the, it's kind of a self-portrait of a way of a, kind of a nightmare. Kate and I talked about this a lot. Like, if you didn't, if you weren't able to act, or I wasn't able to make a movie, like, what you know, what would you become? You know, an artist thwarted is a dangerous thing. You know, is it ask a Germany in the oh well? Is it cathartic though? <laughs> it's not really funny, but it's true. <laughs> The That's Viennese the Academy darkest would have possible taken example. It. Okay, yeah. Is it is it <laughs> cathartic though in some ways to to or is it like some kind of like reverse voodoo to make a film about someone who can't create? I don't know. Well, ultimately, it's about someone who does reconnect and um, does create. It's in the closing credits. We jump ahead. You know, we've been on this kind of plane. Like jump ahead a few years. There's the finished product. It all worked out. Yeah, that wasn't in the script, by the way. It was. It ended on you know the family kind of gets back together, but the we found that footage. I was just in the editing room, and we were. I had this idea to do the drawings, and we started really looking into those stations, and they had built one. It was a British undertaking. I just had to CGI out the the Union Jacks. <laughs> <laughs> America claim it, you know. So, uh, but that was that was it. It was a you know. But uh, I don't think I've answered your original question though. Yeah, my mom did hover over the film. I dedicated it to her. She passed away when I was in, I was in rehearsals. So, um, so yeah, she was kind of there. Did she know that you were working on the movie? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was in rehearsals. Um, yeah, sure. She, she had, plus, we'd been developing it for a while, and I didn't tell her it was you know, about her. But I had been in that position with her before. You know, Boyhood's really about her. You know, Patricia is my mom to some degree, and I was nervous t for her to watch that. But she was, she was always very supportive. She was like, oh, honey, I loved it. She didn't really see herself in it, so <laughs> good. You know. So I'm sure she wouldn't have seen herself at all in this. So the kid perspective is very different. You know, so. 
How much of your own relationship to the challenges of parenting, let's say, does the movie, you know, parenting while being an artist, does the movie represent? I may be asking for more than research purposes here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's, it's the huge challenge, you know? But I have to say, you know, parenting, it's, it's a, it's, it's so much falls on the mom. You know, I was talking to Kate about this. I mean, I've been doing, I've been a parent for a quarter century now, you know, and no one's ever asked me, um, how do you balance work and parenting? <laughs> she gets asked that six times a day. Why? You know, but there it is. You know, I'm going to ask you. It really can does. Can I ask you? Yeah, you how can. How do you balance work and parenting? It's, it's tough. It's really, it's, it's difficult. It takes a lot of uh, effort, but, you know, I'm, I have a lot, I don't know. It, it, it's just psychically tough to not be there at certain times. You know, it's always a balance. You know, but uh, I guess it's easier on me, though. As a man, no one's criticizing me when I'm away from home for a month straight or, you know, go home on a weekend. If you're filming out of town, you know, you try to make it work with your life. But it, uh, you know, you just, you just make it work. Your wife also works on movies with you. Do you no, guys? No, she doesn't. She doesn't? Oh, she, uh -uh. not some, sometimes? No? no? Never? OK. <laughs> My bad. Not in the Sorry. business. <laughs> no. Um, but that can sometimes. You could be in my um, living room on an opening day or sitting around our dinner table, and you wouldn't really know sometimes that I have a film opening that day. Yeah, yeah which is good. <laughs> that's, that's kind of our vibe. But you do, you do watch the films sort of in an early stage with your family. We were talking backstage that there's a little Easter egg for your kids in the film. Oh, yeah, at some point, just kind of when you do start inviting people in the editing room and you start showing it. And particularly this movie, I, want to, I have two 15 year olds. And I, um, I wanted them to watch it. They're friends. They're exactly the same age. They're like two weeks older than Emma, who played B. So I really wanted their perspective. And um, so yeah, they were around when we were shooting the whole time. But I wanted them to see the film. And uh, yeah, they really loved um, the song, you know, time after time. Because we sang that in the car together. So it's fun uh, to have them kind of squealing and going, oh, that's, you know, that's like a little shout out to them, really. But then I do listen to them when they're like, yeah, I like her, I like Emma. But then when they say, ah, oh, you know, I don't like this or that, you know, it's just one more opinion. But it's, it's something from, <laughs> or like, oh, he has kind of a punchy face. I want to, you know, <laughs> whatever I can. What does that mean? You just want to punch somebody. <laughs> I take it as a criticism. <laughs> Did they, did they uh, watch Boyhood in its early stages? Mm, no. They were a little too young. I wasn't. They're in it, actually, just briefly. I think, I don't know if they've even seen it yet. They always fall asleep. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they never make it to the end. So. You, you, you mentioned, Kate, and the idea of parenting, being, parenting while being an artist as something that you know, maybe drew her to the project, too, is something you guys talked about. Yeah, I mean, Kate has f four kids. When we first met, she was in the process of adopting. She has a four year, soon to be five year old that she was kind of in the adoption process with. So yeah, she's, she's amazing. She, Andrew, their kids, I mean, her life and her work are a, a beautiful, she handles it better than anyone I've ever met. I think with that's- With her husband and, you know, he's a theater guy. They're both like hardcore theater artists. He's a playwright, but they, I don't know, they got a wonderful thing going. That's my impression of having yeah. been around her very briefly, is like yeah. she handles everything better than anyone you've ever met. But when you talk to her, she wouldn't say that. You know, she would, she has so, she's so funny about it. You know, examples of picking her kids up at school and people saying, oh, she could have, you know, combed her hair or something, you know, <laughs> cornflakes on her or something. She, she always has very funny stories, but you can't imagine Kate Blanchett being anything but, you know, kind of perfect at most things she does. But yet, at the same time, when you're thinking about a character who is an extremely successful woman who at some point becomes unraveled, like you automatically at some point think, ah, oh, Kate Blanchett, that's what I'm going to have. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and yeah. She, I know she was attached to the film, I think, before you came on, but, but you do really have this sort of unusually long rehearsal process, which is not yeah. that common anymore. How do you discuss the way you know, she unravels on screen this time versus other portrayals? <laughs> yeah, well, I always said, you know, it's, it's tough when you're trying to depict a genius. It sort of, 
it takes a genius to kind of that, that thing. So it's hard to describe, but I, Kate's in a very small, I think, category of, of people I felt could, could pull this off and be interesting and, you know, that someone you would stick with and accept, you know, and not judge in a certain way. But the movie's kind of, we're, we're trying to take you on a journey with her and get to really know someone. At the very beginning of the book, it's a quote from B that's, you know, it's toward the end when she's disappeared, the last part. But it says, just because you can't, you know, her father says, you, no one can ever know anyone completely. And then young B says, well, that, you know, maybe no one can, but that doesn't mean I can't try, you know, I'm going to try. And I said, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to actually get to know her. We're going to give you all the context and we're going to really try to understand this person and see her from all, from all the angles. And I think someone you would judge or pathologize or commit, <laughs> you know, that you really realize, oh, it's really just an artist who needs to get her ass back to work, you know. There's two different roads. And that's why it kind of came up with those, those channels. There, while her husband, who's kind of doesn't know what to do, he's kind of outsourcing his family's health to the industry, you know, and then an old colleague played by Lawrence Fishburne, you know, Paul Jelinek, those roads are going and one ends up, yeah, we should kind of do something about it. And which becomes this kind of intervention. And then the other is the simple correct answer, I believe, in her case, is yeah, you know, you just need to get over your, the pain of, you know, the, your perceived failure from way back and everything you've been through in mothering, you know, it's time to let go of B and, you know, reconnect with yourself. So you'll serve her, herself and the world a lot better. So that's all anyone wants to do, right? You know, to be kind of in sync with the world, doing what you're meant to be. And when you're doing that, like once she makes that, I always saw the Antarctica of it is like she's being sort of mystically drawn. Like why does she, well, we know why she jumps out the window, which is a really good move. Um, but <laughs> but where's she going to go? And to follow up on the flight and go to Antarctica is such the right place. Like sometimes she needs that kind of recalibration. She's sort of mystically like being drawn there. And when you are, it is the right path for her. And when you're on that right path, the world is kind of working. All these people are popping up out of the blue who, who are kind of helping her, who support her. The world's kind of, you know, helping her on the path where when you're in the right track, wrong wrong mindset, maybe not doing what you're supposed to be doing, the world's kind of giving you this all the time. So it's an artist's journey, you know, in that way. So architecture's tough, you know. It's kind of like filmmaking, you know. It's like you have to, it's involved. You have to raise a lot of money. <laughs> they can tell you you can't do it, you know. Architects design a lot of things that don't get built. I write scripts that don't get made, so. <laughs> Someday, hopefully. Talk a little bit about the production design, actually, to that point, because you've got somebody who's this genius, as you said, who's, who's hit a wall. How do you represent that on screen? Yeah, well, you try to hint at it. The house was a fun major character, you know, straight gate, the dilapidated. But it was our thinking, you know, Holly and Vince, my co-adapters of this, you know, for the screenplay, you know, we talked a lot about it, and it's like, well, that, that creativity doesn't go away, it comes out in bursts. You know, you can see it all over the house. These kind of, even though the roof's leaking, you know, this kind of creative flourish of pencils around the door or the folded out books like flowers up the stairway or even the way she treats the bulge in the carpet that she realizes is a plant that's taking over her house, but instead of, you know, she's like, oh, that's pretty cool. So, you know, it's a different kind of person we're dealing with here. Um, so to kind of show that, but then also that, that kind of isolation, antisocial, like, you know, that's a depiction of, of someone who's, you know, got a virtual assistant who doesn't want to, I mean, that's a, that's a shut in. That's someone who needs to, you know, go a new way, you know. But what's it going to be to pull her out of it? And the real crisis hovering over everything is her daughter's <clears throat> leaving four years early for boarding school. So she's not ready for that at all, you know. You've had this amazing track record casting young actors, of course, in Boyhood. This movie you mentioned, Emma Nelson, this is her feature debut. Yeah. Uh, she plays the Bernadette's daughter. And you had that even with early films like Slacker, which was like the starting gate for so many big stars. So what is your 
What is your secret? How do you get these naturalistic performances out of folks? Well, you know, casting, it's one of my favorite, it's the, I don't know, every step of filmmaking is kind of the most important step, but it's a, it's a really important one early, and it's just pure instinctual. You know, you got to get who you feel is right. And Emma didn't really have a resume, but it's, it's a lot easier these days than a long time ago casting, where you had to go, you would travel the country, go to a town, meet a bunch of people, and now everybody just puts themselves on tape. You can just, on your laptop, look at you know, hundreds of people so much easier. And um, so she was one of about 650 people, I guess, young actors going for that part. And that's a major part in this movie, obviously. So I try not to have any preconceived notions about resume or experiences, like who's the person. And she always struck me just how kind of calm and confident she was. I mean, she's really smart. But, um, and then you narrow it down. It gets down to like 50, and then 20, then 10, and then you know, maybe five, and then you, you meet them in person. And you know, pretty soon she's in a room with Kate and Billy, and you know, we're, I'm kind of rehearsing with them like we might do a scene. And I just want to see how she works with everybody. And a lot of the other actors, the more professional kid actors, they're all great. I mean, it's heartbreaking to not, I mean, they're, they're all very good. But you know, they, they knew what they were like, oh, Kate Blanchett just walked in, oh, Billy. And they're kind of, some, you know, Emma's like, Oh, hey, and just talked about what was on her mind. And she didn't really give them, she didn't defer anything, which is a little off-putting, I think, to adults. But I loved it. I was like, oh, I like that confidence. Like, it felt like someone, even though she has an older sister, she felt like an only kid who had been raised by adults, treated like an adult. And that, and that confidence in her own ideas and her, you know, in her calm, I knew, even though she really didn't have film acting experience, she's an actor. She, she told me, yeah, I don't really have a plan B. This is someone who hadn't been in a film. She's done theater and stuff. She lives in the Chicago area. She goes, yeah, I don't really have a plan B. I'm just, I'm going to act. She was like 13 at that point. <laughs> I was like, it's pretty interesting. You don't hear that. They're like, well, I'm just going to be an engineer. I'm going to do this. You know, but no, I'm like, wow, OK. I don't know. Just, just liked her. Just thought she was, had the right demeanor. You know. Talk a little bit about getting the tone right in the movie because you know the book is very it's it's biting the character is, is sharp as she is on screen but maybe yeah. um, maybe a little too sharp for the screen. Yeah, yeah, a little bit in the in the book. You know these multi-page rants are, are hilarious. They're like you're laughing out loud, but you realize just if you have a human <laughs> doing that. You know, a five-minute rant. It's it's funny, but it's depending on what it's about. It's a little off-putting. Um, you know, or like, wow, that it, you are. I don't know. It's just it's too much. So it was always a fine line, particularly with Bernadette, with Kate's character. Just what's the line, you know, between likability and the film's not. She doesn't care if you like her, obviously, but the film wants you to at least empathize. You know, like at what point do we learn who she is? As far as start adding the context, you know, that, oh, she's actually a MacArthur genius who, you know, oh, wow, I'm getting to know. Like, I thought it was like maybe someone you've worked with for years and someone says, hey, did you know they were in that band or they did that in the 80s? Or, you know, like, really? I didn't know that. You know, like something you find out about someone from their past. And I kind of wanted that to be like Kate, like her, her character is like, oh, I didn't really, oh, wow, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, wow. There's this whole other person that you, if you're just judging them on the surface, and that's how we kind of go through life. But the point is, if you really kind of got to know someone, you would understand or empathize with. But it is a fine line where you can lose an audience with a, with a lead character, I think. And I think it's tougher. I think it's obvious it's women are judged differently than men on this, you know, like um, somebody who can be kind of the Latitude for assholishness is, is probably, <laughs> unfortunately, I think it's, it, it was fun to show a woman who could, could be kind of an asshole and go out there. I thought Kate could get away with it. So. <laughs> Did you shoot the five minute rants and then decide later? No, no, well, not maybe. We had already pared them down, but a little more. Yeah, a little more in editing. They were there. But, uh, uh, people, directors often say that they find the film in the editing room. Was that the case uh, with this film? You know, I've never been one of those directors. I always, I guess because I do rehearse and I do kind of do a lot of rewriting and I've, editing, it's, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. 
you know, sometimes two weeks after we wrap, if I've been editing during the shoot, I'll have a pretty close cut of the movie, mm -hmm. just because it's, it's kind of what we did, you know, what we planned, what we, so, but this movie, just when you think you know what you're doing, um, yeah, I was in editing, we, we edited this for one year. Not the usual, like, you know, 20 or 30 weeks or whatever, it was, it was more because, first it was too long, I had like a two hour and 45 minute cut that I thought was pretty great, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it was obviously too long. And so the adaptation process of the book just continued. You know, so it was fascinating to me. I was like, oh, wow, this is what they mean of finding it. And it's not like finding the story. It was always there, but just finding that, dialing it in, sculpting it down. So it became a really fascinating process. I was really happy. I came out of it going, I need to spend a year editing every, every movie. You know, I, I know what Kubrick was thinking now. You know, it's been that Terry Malick, you know, the people who just spend years kind of feeling their way through the... I kind of had to do that a little bit, and I would just keep having screenings in the editing room. Even just invite four people in, two, two of whom you don't know at all, just to know others are watching it. You see your movie in a different way, and you find redundancies. It's like, oh, do we need that? Because they say that later. You know, it's, it, was, it was kind of a discovery, but I just think it was the complexity and of the storytelling, and to realize that anything that strayed too far from mother-daughter here, like that was really the spine. And it was written that way, but I didn't know to what degree. You know, it was like, oh, anything that goes too far. So, you know, you end up cutting out a lot of really good stuff that you think's great, and characters in their entirety, and things like LG's TED Talk was much longer, or the documentary within the film. That's, you know, we had a much longer version, but you don't, you end up, you don't really need all of it. A little goes a long way. Audiences get ahead of you, so. It, it was, it felt our way through it, you know. You did actually also get to actually shoot in the Arctic for this. Yeah. Which, for those of us who this is as close as Both we're going to get. Both poles. Yeah. yeah. Tell, us, tell us, what. how did you finagle that? What is that experience like? Yeah, I mean, that was there. It's like, ooh, you know, how are we going to shoot in Antarctica? Or how are we going to depict that? You know, you kind of have to really go there. So the when we were shooting, when it was clear, when actors were available, we were shooting, you can't shoot in Antarctica. It's like, oh, that's going to be winter down there, and you, you can't go down there. So the year before our winter, their summer, um, I kind of pre-visualized. This is like boring technical, but just pre-visualized all the shots down there. And then uh, my DP and a, another cameraman, um, they went down there and just shot plates and penguins, you know? Because <laughs> that's the only thing when you go to the North Pole. Um, it's all there, the icebergs, everything's there except penguins. So every penguin you see was from the actual Antarctica, from Antarctica. I've heard from other filmmakers who've shot there that it's so pristine that it actually looks digital, like yeah. digitally created, like CGI, I and know. that's a problem. It's so clean. Yeah, yeah. I've even, I had a, yeah, someone accused us that. Well, we got caught in an Arctic uh, hurricane. We were living on this boat for that, you know, six, seven days and a huge storm blew in, and I was filming up to the point where the, we just couldn't do it anymore. You know, say cut, the whole crew would drift away, throw up, come back. <laughs> if you look closely, there's a scene, it's Christmas time, there's that Christmas tree in the background when they're ha she and Becky are having pink penguins. If you look closely, the ornaments are kind of going. <laughs> and there's a scene where Kate comes through that door and you see the sea behind it, that's, that's real. It was the last thing we shot before they said, you gotta shut this down. Everybody has to just go below and ride, the, ride this out the next 36 hours in this washing machine of a, um, but, uh, yeah. Um, but it was the last thing we shot, I was proud of it. I was like, oh, we gotta get it. We got a real storm and you know, it's about her seasickness going through the Drake Passage, let's get that. And uh, she, she walks through the door, we're done. And then, okay, cut to, a, you know, whatever. Nine months later, I'm, I'm having a test screening with some people, and they go, yeah, the CGI in the background of her coming through, I, I didn't really buy it. I'm like, you didn't? Okay, interesting. You didn't buy it, okay. We didn't buy it either, because it was real. <laughs> um, if for better or for worse, you have this kind of reputation as, a, as this sort of slackery filmmaker, even though you're both, you know, very productive and wildly inventive. 
Of a what kind of filmmaker? As a kind of a slackery creative guy, even though you're pr okay. very productive <laughs> and you've got you know a totally inventive track record yeah, yeah. of film. You know, like people always thought the before trilogy, yeah. the scripts for those were improvised, which I know they were not. They not a were, word. They were very carefully written. Yeah. Does it bother you to have that kind of vibe about you when you're in fact a very conscientious and ambitious filmmaker? Um, no, no, it's actually a compliment. You know, that's what I'm going for. I, I want you to think it's just happened. Re you know, I'm trying to go for a reality. I want it to feel real, but I mean, anyone who gets too close to the process knows, you know, nothing's real. It's all a construct. So, um, yeah, I've never been, I, I think I have too much of a writery, rehearsal, acting, theater-y, I'm talking way back, like college, but kind of basis for cinematic storytelling. I would never just turn on a camera and see what, what happens. Although I have done that with the right person in the right time for a very knowing kind of the zone in a certain kind of movie, uh, like Waking Life or something. You know, so I had some nice parts that, I mean, I kind of knew what they were gonna do, but it wasn't word for word rehearsed. There's certain kind of performers that you know they can, they can't do it twice, which are professional actors. It's one thing, but sometimes I'm working with kind of really inspired personalities who aren't actors in certain films, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll know to not overdo it or over-rehearse it or something. But, but uh, you know, my definition of slacker from way back wasn't anyone who wasn't productive. It was just someone who didn't, um, maybe wasn't making something that had a place in the, you know, socioeconomic you know, marketplace. They had their projects, which is true for so many of my films. So. Do you feel <laughs> I like don't have not, much of a place. In do you feel like you're I'm not, really happy to do them. Do you feel like you're not gonna get any Amazon Originals deals now because of what this movie says about Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll love it. You know, people <laughs> like the, the self, you know. Flagellation. Trade. Yeah, a little bit, I think they do. You know, Maria lives there, and I, I went with her to Seattle, and they were very open. You know, I got tours of, you know, Microsoft, and everybody was very, I think they were, they were open. I think they all liked the book, you know. I mean, didn't all the Mormons like Book of Mormon? You know, it's like, <laughs> you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. So. <laughs> um, so I, I'm sure most of you guys know Rick mostly lives in Austin. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't know about what a central point of the Austin film scene he is, he is mm -hmm. the central point, at least one of them of the Austin film scene. He supports a lot of young filmmakers. Like I'm talking, he gives money to their Kickstarters at that wow. level. Uh, oh, we have a grant program. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you're a founder of the Austin Film Society. Um, your production space there is kind of a locus of the community. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you get out of that film scene and staying outside of literal Hollywood. Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky. I think I came along at a time, like the people, the generation older than me, much older, I've gotten to know, they kind of had to. They didn't have a choice. Even if they lived here in New York, it's like, you know, you think of the Bogdanoviches, Demi, Scorsese's. They, they knew they had to go to LA, get an agent, make work for Corman, you know. <laughs> work their way up that. By the time I came along, you know, the indie world had kind of solidified and they didn't care that you could, um, you know, stay where you were, do a, you know, a, a regional film or whatever the hell that means. So I just tried it and it worked, you know, like my first film that I would have never thought would get any, um, you know, slack or a depiction of my neighborhood, basically my town, my friends, um, my crazy mindset at that time. That I, I never thought it would get an audience that people outside of Texas would, would want to see a non like cowboy movie from Texas. But uh, yeah, it caught on. I was very um, surprised and thankful and all that. It was it played in New York forever. You know, it was it was fun. So it played for like a year at the <laughs> Angelica. I think it, I still go by the Angelica. And go, wow, that's played there forever. Films don't do that anymore. It was a different time. So, um, and then I was lucky, my next film I was doing, Dazed and Confused, uh, they're like, well, where do you want to shoot it? And I'm like, like, well, if I do it in Austin, it'll be cheaper. And they're like, yeah, sure, they don't care. <laughs> Hollywood doesn't really care you know, if you can save them some money. And it's like that to the, this day with incentive programs and you know, they don't really care where you shoot. So I said, well, I can kind of base here. But you know, you pay the price a little bit. 
so many people I don't know. You know, you're not an insider. You don't, you know, not going to the parties. I'm in New York much more than I am L.A. But uh, I always have a good time, you know, wherever I am. It's just, I don't know, it was home, you know. Not only family, but I have this, the film society I started in 85, you know. So that's, you know, when you have a nonprofit, that, that's like having a, you know, a family, you know, there, kid. I'm still artistic director. So I don't know, there's all those reasons. Got to live somewhere. But, <laughs> but it has been fun to see the film community really grow up. We have a lot of great filmmakers there. And, um, yeah, all kinds of films being made there. Well, we're almost out of time, but I want to end on a real light question about failure. Um, because one of, one of the things that, one of the, the stories that this movie yeah. you know, tells is about how people respond to failure and about the idea that maybe you, know, you could have a roadblock for a long time, which is yeah. very common in the film world, and then still turn it, yourself around. Yeah, I, I bore people with sports analogies, but I, I had been like a team sports guy, baseball, football, and I, I think I took that into filmmaking. You know, like you have to be, as an athlete, you have to be your own best friend. Like, say you go 0 for 4 in baseball hitting, but you go, you know, I, I hit the ball well four times. I can't help it that it was right at somebody or that guy made a great catch. In the books, it says 0 for 4. And you can look at that and say he failed, but I know I didn't. I did this, I did that, or I did, you know? I need to work on this. And you just have to be honest with yourself in your self-evaluation. The world can think whatever it thinks. But um, so I remember taking that in. I was like, well, this is what I got out of this film. I never accepted anyone's judgment, even though when you have a demonstrable like box office failure, I was always, well, they can't take away from me the experience of the movie or what I think of it, or I made the film I wanted to make. I, I, you know, so you realize what you control, what you can't control. And fortunately, the arts aren't sports. It's not zero sum. There's not a winner and loser. So it's, it's pretty subjective. And that goes for everything, box office, awards, you know, all that. So you just have to have a really healthy um, relationship with what you do and, and try to. And, you know, admit, like, I've done films that people liked a lot, and I say, well, I think this works, but I think I failed here, and I'm gonna work on, I can do better. I, kn I privately know I failed here, even though people seem to like the movie. I know, personally, I came up short here. So I'm gonna, you know, so you, you have to be honest with yourself. But yeah, you deal with it all the time. You know, you, you just have to have the right attitude. And, Bernadette in this movie is just having trouble getting over this loss. And it's not even her failure. No one said that house sucked. She built the house. It just got destroyed. This asshole bought it, kind of from, stole it and made it a parking lot, which is heartbreaking. You know, it'd be like to hear, you know, one of your films, you know, it would be like a death. So I could see where that would be so hard to get over. But get over it, you must, you know, somehow. Part of it is you, you have to build up you know, really thick skin. It's easy, it's easy to say. You have to kind of earn that through a lot of, uh, you know, you got to have your own dark nights of the soul and, and get over a lot of crap. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it's important. You know, it's an important part of being able to proceed, you know, definitely. It's an important part of being an artist and an important part of being yeah. a person in the world. With everything. Yeah, with everything. Every, you're always doing that. Just everything you do, you know. The film side, we opened a theater two years ago. The first year, we struggled. We're doing great now, but we're like, okay, what's not working here? You know, let's get together. Oh, we don't need a kitchen. We don't need it. You know, let's write the ship. You know, you just got to be honest. You got to do it. Um, but the arts, it's more vague. It's more like the world will tell you if they like your what you're doing, but it's your relation to it that's probably the most important. That's why I think I never, I didn't go to film school because I didn't want anyone criticizing me. I was so thin-skinned and so, I'm sensitive, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I get asked to be a jury, on a jury at a film festival these years, and I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to judge anyone. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to judge. <laughs> and that's all you're being is judged. But it's just like, I don't want to put that energy out there, you know, it's just where I'm at right now. But I realized early on, I was, I was like that from the beginning. I didn't want some professor who didn't know me <laughs> and where I felt I was going or my bigger ideas to judge some early film that I know kind of sucks, you know, that I'm learning and I can't say, oh, I'll be good 
four years from now, I'll be better. You know, I know, you know it's just like, eh, just, um, you know, fail in your own way and know that it's, you can tell you're on the right path when you spent months or a lot of time on something. You do it, it's a failure, and you don't regret one second you spent on it. That's when you know, oh, okay, I'm meant to do this. You know, because it's like I wasn't going for the result. I wasn't, you know, I was learning. I enjoyed the process. And I'll do it again, and, you know, maybe it'll be better. The perpetual Ed Wood in me, like, <laughs> maybe the next one will be better. You know, so it's like, you know, you got to, I love that movie. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's the right attitude. Well, rest I mean, it's nice to have a little talent, maybe, you know, if, if, if the world is giving you that. But, you know, it's like, it's always a, it's always an interesting thing, putting, putting something out in the world. But... You know, you got to not care that much. You know. Well, rest assured that we all love you. No. Oh. Thank you guys so much. For <laughs> terrific audience. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little Really nice. Really nice talking to you. So. Thank you. So we done. <laughs>